We've got six wines to chat about this evening. Um, before we do, I thought I'd introduce you with some little facts um, about picnics, outdoor eating, garden parties. The first one is that it's actually a national picnic week as well as being English wine week. So it's a nice double-edged sword of celebrations on this Friday evening. The um, French actually started the modern fashion for picnics when they opened their royal parks to the public after the revolution in 1789. And in Britain, it really took off with um, Queen Victoria having breakfasts, as she called them, um, in her royal parks in the 1860s to entertain her noble guests, which then developed into the Queen's garden parties of today. Do let us know if any of you have been to any of the Queen's garden parties um, or if you know anyone that has. Apparently around 27,000 cups of tea, 20,000 sarnies and 20,000 slices of cakes are served on any one event. But unlike our event this evening, it's apparently a dry event and it is only tea that is served. And picnic food in its popularity is ever increasing. This is a slightly outdated study, but in 2012, they discovered that the average um, person per week consumed 10 grams of meat pies and sausage rolls. So it seems that that doesn't take a picnic to have some picnic food. Now, I'm sure you'll be very pleased to know I'll be back throughout this evening with some extra facts on some of the other foods. But let's start with the first wine, Matthew. Let's kick off. God, how do I follow that? Incredible. Um, good evening, everybody. It is, it's sunny now here in Hertfordshire, which is lovely. It's been raining all day. So unfortunately, I can't get outside and share the picnic because the, the dog would be going crazy. Hope you're all well. I see that Mike P is literally in a glass of wine right now, which is fantastic. Um, so yeah, let's crack on with wine number one. Um, so we've got the Society's Exhibition English Sparkling Wine. I should probably also say it is technically English Wine Week this week um, and we've been celebrating English wine all week with loads of different offers and videos and so anyone that tunes in, tunes in regularly to our events is probably sick of my face already this week because this is the third I've done um, but this is definitely the most relaxed and most fun so please ask questions, shout about what you're drinking, you know let's just all enjoy a glass of wine together. So this is the Exhibition English Sparkling Wine uh, which is produced for us by Ridgeview in Sussex. Uh, Ridgeview we've been working with for 20 years this year, which is fantastic. Um, if anybody's watched our video on YouTube for English Wine Week, um, it's, yeah, it's great. I highly recommend it. You can get a little bit more of the backstory of Ridgeview as I speak to Simon, the winemaker, and his sister, Tamara, the CEO. And yeah, here are some lovely pictures of Ridgeview. It's about 10, 13 miles from the coast. And so you can see the, the hills there. Just the other side of those hills uh, is Brighton, basically. And uh, it's in a lovely area called Ditchling. And it's very much a, a family-run winery. It's run by the Roberts family, plus a few others. And um, it's just an absolute pleasure to visit them every time because they are just such a charming, welcoming, very accommodating family and winery. And so, you know, if you're in the area, do stop by and say hello. In terms of the actual wine... It is Chardonnay dominant. It's about 60% Chardonnay. It spends, uh, so all, although it's a non-vintage wine, the base vintage for the current match is 2018. And so it spends two years on the lees, roughly. We, uh, we increased it at the start of last year just to give it a little bit more lees aging, to give it that slightly more biscuity, bready flavour. Um, lees aging, just to give a very brief overview because the secondary fermentation which is where the bubbles are created are done in the bottle in the actual bottles this is not just a bottle it's a fermentation vessel as well technically um, the yeast lees are in the bottle with the wine as well and so that's where you get the yeast autolysis which is the breakdown of those yeast cells and they start giving the wine those bready pastry like biscuity flavors um, so the longer you stay, you keep the wine on the lees before riddling and disgorgement, the more bready, savoury flavours that you'll get. And so most non-vintage champagne is, is 24 months minimum. And so we wanted to make sure that this was the same amount of time. Um, dosage is about 8.8 .8 grams. Um, I say about, it is. Um, and uh, that just kind of gives the wine a bit more of a richer, fuller mouthfeel. 
And um, it means that once the wine goes under cork, so this was disgorged about four or five months ago, those sugars react with the um, with the amino acids in the wine because English sparkling wine, believe it or not, is typically quite acidic. It's normally this kind of drive of acidity which propels English wine into kind of this really lively, fresh style. Um, and it's that reaction between the sugars and the amino acids which gives that kind of caramelly flavour. And although this is still quite young, it's nice and fresh and lemony. If you were to leave it longer, I'm sure it will develop those kind of more caramel notes a bit more. Um, and it's just this lovely, fresh, very zesty, very citrus led, lemony, limey um, English sparkling wine with, as I said, that seam of acidity coming through from the Chardonnay, which I think is great. Um, we blend it, I blend it every year with Ridge for you. We do the dosage trials kind of a couple of years later. Um, and yeah, this is some of the last of the 2018 batch. And so um, I'm, I'm very pleased with it. It was pretty much the first one that I was in any way involved in. And uh, yeah, it's gone down very well. If you're drinking it tonight, let us know what you think. Um, shall I talk about the next fizz as well? Or shall I, or do we want to talk about food? Yeah, let's let's go on to the next fizz and then we'll come back and we can, we can do the food for both because there is a little crossover. Yep. Things you can have, but let's go on to this one. Cool. Um, any questions about the exhibition in English, please shout. Um, but yeah, let's pour the Camel Valley. So this is Camel Valley. So this is in uh, Cornwall. It's pretty much the most westerly winery vineyard in the UK. And in the Camel Valley, uh, they have predominantly granite soils with some sand and some loam. And it produces, I think, quite broad, quite rich, quite fruity styles of wine. And this is Pinot Noir dominant. Um, I'm just trying to get up my notes to see if I've got the exact blend of it. I don't, sorry. Uh, but it's Pinot Noir dominant. It's where you get that lovely kind of red, red currant and cherry flavours from. And unlike the exhibition wine, this is a vintage wine. So this is 2018. I spent a year on the lees and the reason why it's only a year is really to promote those fruity, light, approachable, early drinking styles of, of wine. And also that extra time under cork means that you can develop those reactions a little bit quicker and those kind of bruised red apple um, plummy notes come through really easily when it's spent a bit of time on the cork and I tasted this wine I mean we, we've been we've been stocking this wine consistently most summers for the last three or four years it is for me one of if not the best English rosé sparkling wines that you can get and we've been selling it for about three or four years but when I tried the 2018 at the start of this year I was just blown away I just thought it was unbelievably good and so I bought an outrageous amount of it um thinking that you know members are going to love this this is going to be awesome we can sell it all year and people are going to just go crazy for it um not only do members go crazy for it but also the judges at respective awards went crazy for it it won the IWC gold best in show best sparkling rosé of England earlier this year and it meant that pretty much everything I bought got absolutely decimated um, because it's just so drinkable and so lovely. And so we've managed to get a little bit more for this English Wine Week offer, um, but it does just offer this lovely cherry, cranberry, slightly kind of rose hippie. I get that a little bit with um, with a traditional method, rosé sparkling wines, and this very generous mouthfeel. 2018 was you know, an unbelievable year, not just qualitatively, but quantitatively as well for English wine. And so yields were massive, but quantity was was outstanding. And so you get this lovely, plump, very attractive, red fruited sparkling wine with a little bit of savoury character as well, because you don't want that to overpower the, the nice clean fruit. So yeah, that's the Camel Valley Rosé Brut Pinot Noir 2018. There okay. you go. I'm going to make a very bold claim. And I think I'm going to be bold in saying that the, the Camel Valley Rosé Brood, I think, is my favourite sparkling wine. I'm going to put it out there because it is truly delicious. Yeah. It is so, so nice, isn't it? It's lovely. Absolutely. So 
looking at sort of the food and wine pairing element of it, let's go back to the exhibition English sparkling wine. If you've come to any of our uh, lunches or dinners at Stevenage around the country, this is one that we love to use as um, an aperitif wine. And it's got that really nice cleansing crispness from the acidity, but it's also perfect for things like um, little nibbles, so little cheese straws, little um, crisps, if you just want to kind of jazz up your, your Friday evening snack. Anything that's got a little bit of oiliness um, and a bit of that savory component, then the, the fresh acidity and the, the citrus notes of the, the wine really help to sort of cleanse the palate and cut through. And it also goes really nicely with any um, seafood based things. So smoked salmon is the big one. It acts as the spritz of lemon. Or if you had uh, perhaps, um, oh, I don't know, maybe some uh, a prawn cocktail or some um, potted shrimp as your, your component to your, your um, garden party or your picnic, it would be a really lovely fresh wine to have with that. The Camel Valley is a little bit of a, um, a bit of a, a do all options wine as well. So it'll work in the same way that it's got that lovely fresh acidity. Um, so anything that's a bit, um, some seafood or, cause it's got the ripeness as well from the, the red fruits. So charcuterie, um, light cheeses, but also because it's got the fruit sweetness, it's got that real plump fruity character. You can have it with some strawberries, raspberries, little delicate cakes, so some Victoria sponge, some petit fours. Um, it kind of covers all bases. So if you're perhaps thinking you only want the one sparkling wine for your garden party or, or picnic, you can go with the Camel Valley, but why limit yourself to one? You can have one of each and it will bookend them for you. I think we do have a question about the Camel Valley, uh, Matthew. It's from Mike. He's asking whether Camel Valley add any red wine to the bottle or does the rosé colour come from leaving the wine on the Pinot Noir skins to extract the colour? I've, I've, I've answered it in the chat, sorry, but um, uh, no, I believe they, they do leave it on the skins to extract the colour. It's 100% Pinot Noir. And so, um, yeah, they leave, leave it on the skins for eight, 12 hours sort of thing to extract some colour. Although um, the UK is the only place other than Champagne that you are legally allowed to blend red and white wine in order to make your traditional head sparkling wine. You can't do it anywhere else in, the, in Europe. And so um, nice, okay. nice little bonus fact there for you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Shall we go on to the next wine, the Pinot Blanc? Yes. So the Pinot Blanc, uh, this is from Stoppham. Um, most importantly for me, I think it's worth saying that um, 2020, of which this wine is, is a really great year for English wine. Um, unfortunately, due to, due to frosts in kind of 13th, 14th of May last year, yields are, are not great. And so there's not much wine, but quality is, I think, the highest, if not joint highest of 2018. And so when... When you're buying English wine, certainly in terms of my role buying English wine, my my main priority is getting the latest vintage available for members. And so a lot of my time is spent convincing wineries to release their latest vintage when it's done. So many people hold on to vintages for far too long and it and it's not great because English still wine does age, but you know, you want you want the latest vintage, and so the the offer that we put together for English Wine Week this week, there's a still wine case based on 2020 wines. They are the freshest, they're the best, they're the most interesting, and that's that's what I would want to drink, the latest, nicest, freshest vintage. And Stopham have been brilliant with that sort of thing. And so their 2019 was hugely popular. We didn't sell it, unfortunately. I tasted it, and it was absolutely wonderful. I went to buy it, but they'd already sold out. Um, and so they were they were very, very generous in letting us take some 2020 early. Um, they are based in West Sussex and the vineyards are planted in 2007. And it's kind of on free draining, sandy, loamy soils. You can see pictures there, um, which, you know, is, is just perfect for English viticulture. And Pinot Blanc is not seen that much in the UK. It's a it's a pretty minor grape variety. 
However, I do think it makes genuinely quite nice, well, very nice white wines. It is by no means from people who are Pinot Blanc experts, you know, the, the world's most outrageously aromatic or characterful grape variety but it, what it does do is make very clean elegant appley stone fruity white wines that are best unoaked and just make this quite nice textured white wine and i think stop and make a really lovely example of it it's just got this wonderful aroma of crushed apples and kind of Braeburn apples and the palette. I'm just going to check stuff. I've not tried this yet today. Hmm. You know, I said that 2020 is a good year and with English still wine, there's this real palette issue sometimes with, with poorer years, you get a real hollow palette and with great years like 2020, it's like this constant flavor, kind of load if that makes sense and this is just this lovely weight throughout the palette and another thing with Pinot Blanc is that it's not an overtly acidic grape and so this is not you know English wine is characterized by its acidity as I've already mentioned this has actually got a lovely softness to it they probably do some lee stirring a little bit of batonnage just to just to soften it out but this has just got this lovely kind of apple pie kind of softness to it which is which is just really wonderful um and yeah we've we've not done too much with stop them in the past but um you know i'm, I'm keen to keep you going with them because i think that they do make wonderful still wines because they do specialize in still wines they're not a producer that does sparkling wines and then makes still wines on the side they do and their their purpose is is still wine and i just think it's just super elegant and a, a really good if, if, if someone was wanting to try an English wine for the first time and you were a little bit nervous, I think this Stop and Pinot Blanc is a, is a good one to go for because it's it's a very gentle awakening to, to English still wine. Absolutely. It's got that, it's really approachable, isn't it? It's got that really nice delicacy and ripeness of fruit. It's really, I mean, it's like really nice pear. Yeah. Pear is definitely it. And um, a lot of English wines, especially those that are Bacchus driven, can be quite green and herbal. And, you know, I like that, you know, Sauvignon Blanc can be quite green and herbal, but this Pinot Blanc is, you know, it's not, it's very fruit driven. It's pears, it's apples, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's fruit driven, which is great. So Absolutely. Yeah. the delicacy means it's a really nice wine to pair with things that are quite delicate in flavour themselves. So things like um, quiches or burgers, so something egg-based, not necessarily an egg, we'll get onto those in a minute, but um, <laughs> like a, a creamy sort of a quiche or a frittata or um, sort of some light white meats or soft cheeses, delicate fish. It's got enough acidity that it, helps counterbalance the the creaminess of those dishes but it's not got so much that it's a real stark contrast so Pinot you know, Blanc is one of those wines that's really nice for those um creamier dishes dishes that are lighter in flavor it's when you're thinking of food and wine matching as well as looking at a sort of flavor profile you're also wanting to consider the balance of the the structure and the concentration of fruit in a wine with the flavors that you've got in your in your dish as well. So if anyone has any comments or questions on the Pinot Blanc, do pop them in the chat and let us know. Or if anyone's having anything to eat that's going particularly well with any of the wines this evening, do let us know as well. Yeah, I should say also stop stop them are very hot on their um, sustainability. And so I won't go through it today, but pop onto their website and you know they've got an absolute wealth of 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 stuff that they do for sustainability and schemes they sign up sign up to and yeah they're definitely some of the good guys in in english winemaking and yeah i think i think this wine is genuinely delicious it's really nice wonderful before we go on would we perhaps like some uh, facts about quiche always <laughs> i'm always keen for quiche facts well. Did you know that the 20th of May is National Quiche Lorraine Day? So we're a little bit after the after the date now, but um, if you want to celebrate post-date, get yourself a quiche Lorraine this weekend. Wow. <laughs> the, the classic French quiche, it was um, originally 
from Germany in the medley medieval kingdom of Lothringen, which was under German rule, but then renamed Lorraine when became under French rule. And the largest quiche was created in Paris in November of 1997 by Chef Alain Morcotelieu. And he used 125 quarts of milk, 1,928 eggs, 156 pounds of bacon, 134 pounds of butter, and more than 140 pounds of flour. So you'd need a lot of Pinot Blanc to wash down that quiche. And a very big oven. Or, Absolutely. Or wherever, <laughs> or wherever they cooked it. Lovely. Let's go on to the Chardonnay, unless we've got any, let's just check, we've got any questions coming through? Oh, how did they get the middle cooked? I'm not entirely sure. You don't want to I, I can't get the middle cooked in my quiches and I've got, you know, it's a standard quiche size. And so, how yeah. did you? impressive. But they didn't say it might, it's the largest, but they didn't say it was the best. So, you know, it may, it, may not, it may not have been cooked yeah, in the middle. It edible, <laughs> it was just the biggest. Um, great. So, um, Simpsons. So, we've, we're weirdly enough, we're doing a bit of a tour of the UK at the moment, which is fantastic. So, mm. Simpsons are based in Kent near Canterbury. Here's the, the bottle, and you see it on your screen there. And I first encountered Simpsons before I took over the role of, of England buyer about, about two years ago, actually, now, where I went to the Wines of GB tasting. And, um, uh, they were there showcasing it must have been their 2017 wines because this was this was 2019 it was summer of um or maybe yeah maybe 2018 so i think it was actually their 2018 sorry i'm getting getting my times mixed up it was their 2018 that they were showing and i was just instantly very very impressed with them because um, for those for those that know, the Simpsons family have a have a have a winery in the in the southwest of France called uh, Domaine de la Rose, I believe. And so they're 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 not new to winemaking, uh, and they have a, a, a decent history of producing very very nice stuff. And they decided to return to their native England, to their native Kent specifically, the Garden of England, and you know try their hands at English production and. The first thing, I mean, I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to winemaking and wine stuff. And so the first thing they started talking to me about was what clones they were using, which I thought was obviously fascinating. Um, and saying how, you know, this is this clone, this is 675, this is yada, 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 the type they use in Burgundy in this particular region. And I was like, okay, these guys, you know, they know what they're on about. I tried the wines, tried the 2018 they didn't have, I think they did actually have the Gravel Castle there, which is this wine, and the Roman Road, which is their kind of premium still Chardonnay. And I was like, wow, this is really bloody good. I would love to, to buy this, but I wasn't the buyer. Um, and um, yeah, I was just very impressed. I thought they were very, very smart, very intelligent. The wines were lovely, very clean, and had that mouthfeel, that weight on the palate, which I spoke about. And then fast forward a couple of years and, you know, thankfully I, I got made England by it, which is fantastic. And one of the first people I contacted was Simpsons because I thought, you know what, I need a still Chardonnay that is A, delicious and B, at a reasonable price. And yeah, they've produced this absolutely, I think, sensational but uniquely English Chardonnay from 2020. Again, 2020, common theme. So this is their gravel castle. Um, the vines actually at, at Simpsons were, were planted in um, uh, in 2014. Uh, you can see some pictures there. Um, so they originally planted 10 hectares in Kent, um, which is their Roman Road vineyard, which is along the side of the first Roman Road that the Romans marched up to invade England in AD 43 which is quite cool. Um, and then they've planted roughly 30, 40 hectares since then, including um, Railway Road, which is a hark back to an old railway from the 18, uh, 1800s, I believe, that was there. And then Gravel Castle, which is uh, where this wine comes from. And, you know, Chardonnay is one of those grapes that, you know, you can grow it almost anywhere, but 
when in a too marginal, too cool climate, it can be quite green, it can be quite austere, it can be quite, you know, not as generous as you would like with Chardonnay. And I find this actually is 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 not that. It's still got that seam of acidity that you'd expect from England. It's still super fresh, um, but it is very approachable still. And you will not find Chardonnay, 100% Chardonnay from the UK for under 15 quid, I think, probably for another three or four years. Um, that is this good, certainly. Um, there's there's a little bit of barrel there, maybe. And there's just this lovely peachy, melony, classic Chardonnay aromas. And the palate is, is generous, which which you want from Chardonnay. You want a generous palate. It should be quite full. It should be quite textural. Um, and with this, this lovely fresh acidity that kind of keeps it all going. And so, yeah, I think Simpsons are just one of the most exciting um, wineries in the UK at the moment, certainly for their still wines. I've not bought any of the sparkling wines, to be perfectly honest, but I think their still wines are really very exciting. Um, and I will be buying their Roman Road 2020 because it is seriously good. And maybe their Pinot Noir as well. And so, yeah, if anyone's got the Simpsons, I would love to know what you think. Because um, I think in terms of English, 100% Chardonnay at this price, I think it's unbeatable. So it's lovely texture, isn't it? Really nice. We've had a question from Richard. Um, it's quite nice and timely, which is given the French competition, have any English Chardonnays won any prizes yet or are being recognised? In terms of international competitions, I don't know. Um, but um, Simpsons are pretty regular winners of kind of best Chardonnay in, in the UK. And I know their Roman Road 2018 was best in show at IWC uh, last year. Um, but in terms of international competitions, I don't know, you know, it's, it's such a different style, you know, you can't, you can't, it's difficult to compare. I think that sparkling wine, traditional method sparkling wine in England, I think it's got to the point where you can compare them. I don't necessarily want people to, because I think English sparkling wine has got its own charms that shouldn't necessarily be compared to champagne, but I think still wine is, is some way off. You know, I think if you were, if you were to get a lineup of 10 Burgundies, and one English Chardonnay, I think you'd be able to pick the English Chardonnay time after time. Whereas with traditional method sparkling, I think you'd struggle. Um, so I think we're still a little bit way off it kind of different, it kind of amalgamating itself with, with Burgundy and other, you know, classic Chardonnay wine production areas. Um, so, you know, I think at the moment it's about finding the best Chardonnay in England mm. and finding the, the best premium Chardonnay in England, for example, because that's the difficult thing. That's that's in terms of the England range. I think that's kind of where I earn my my corn and I try and pick out the the best that we have to offer. And I think currently what we're showing this evening is kind of the best that we've got, certainly from 2020. So yeah, and then one of the things that's often kind of commented on in terms of um particularly English still wines more so now with the English sparkling wines sort of earning their place in the, the premium more premium wine category but with still wines it's still a question of why are they so much more expensive in comparison um you know and you said this is when the the best ones under 15 like that you said so could you touch slightly on why it's why they are comparatively that bit more expensive i mean the the, the, the easiest way to say is that um most English vineyards and wineries, because this is this is a winery, it's not a vineyard that's getting their wine made somewhere else. The investment in a winery is huge, hundreds of thousands of pounds. And so that has to be taken into account. You know, these these people haven't invested a winery like a lot of places in the in the classic Chardonnay production areas. Um, it's not something that's been handed down to them. They have invested in it. And so they need to make their money back. Um, another thing is yield. The yield is crazy in England. I think we went from 35,000 hectolitres, doesn't necessarily mean that much to people, but just keep that in mind, to 100,000 hectolitres from 2017 to 2018. So 35,000 hectolitres in 2017, 100,000 in 2018, 
down to about 40,000 in 2019. And so, you know, yields are all over the shop. <laughs> you know, it's, it's almost impossible to know what you're going to be getting. Um, but uh, I, you know, I do think that we need to be better. This is going to be me being completely honest because, you know, it's Friday night, we can be honest. When, when there is a great year, like 2018, people need to be better at pricing their wines to sell out rather than pricing their wines where they think it needs to be priced and then still selling their wine three years later. You know, I'm still contacting some wineries asking for their latest wine and they're still selling the 2018. I don't want that. Nobody wants that. Um, certainly not for kind of the entry level stuff. Um, so it's it's difficult. It's it's getting people to sell wine to, well, price wine to sell. I'm getting into a completely different tangent here. Sorry. I'm, I'm, we'll I'm, move back I'm, in a moment. <laughs> I'm classic on tangents. Sorry. Um, but it, it's just one of those issues that we have with England. You know, you go from a really awful year which you've hardly got any wine to sell. You know, I've got some wineries that have already sold out of their 2020 and it's only halfway through the year. Um, and then you go to a bumper crop and you just don't know what to do. You know, you think, oh, do I price it how I did my last vintage and then have to keep selling it two or three years after harvest and that's going to delay my next crop? It's it's such a difficult one. But um, what was the question? <laughs> 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 God, I, I ramble like nobody's business. Um, uh, I genuinely can't remember what I was answering the question. <laughs> sorry, this isn't this isn't looking good for my MW exam coming up next week, <laughs> next month. Sorry, we've had some lovely comments from Jeff and Jane um, about what they they're drinking the wine. They're saying it's got some nice balance of some citrus green fruits and some stone fruit, mm -hmm. um, some wet stones too, and. I'm getting that is that lovely wine term minerality, which we don't fully know what it means, but we do know what it means. You know, if you're going to, you can taste it, but can you taste it? It's definitely, it's definitely there. And Chardonnay, I think the most sort of basic food pairing that we could say to have with this would be something like a roast chicken, cold roast chicken, um, something with a, a nice bit of that proteiny mouthfeel that will really um, balance nicely with the texture of the wine. Um, maybe something a bit bulkier as well, maybe the, the sort of pasta salads, chickpea salads that you can throw together now, um, mm -hmm. anything with a bit of avocado in there, something that's a bit richer of a food because you've got that texture, you've got the concentration of the fruit, and you've got the really nice acidity as well. Yeah. I think it's almost, I don't know where this comes from, but I think I always get like a slightly kind of marzipan-y sort of, sort yeah. of flavour to it, which is, you know. Yeah, it's kind of like a nutty almondy. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. almond, yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't know whether that's kind of like the reductive winemaking. Um, a, a good comment there, sorry, from, from Sheena and Martin about frost protection as well for England. I mentioned on Monday, if you've not watched it, check it out on YouTube with Black Chalk, that Black Chalk have got 25 hectares of vines and if they were to use the bougies, the little candles that you light up to protect from frost, it would cost them £25,000 a night to use those frost candles. And so they use like a, a gas propane machine, which blasts hot air out instead. Um, but there are, you know, some, someone like Ridgeview, they selectively don't protect some of their vineyards because they know that they will not make a profit from that area of vines were they to spend you know, with their, with a winery their size, like 150 grand a night on frost protection. So they just leave it and, you know, go pfft, lost it. So it's difficult. It's, it's those sorts of decisions, which, which possibly people don't think about, you know, do I just leave my vineyard to, to be destroyed for the year? Or do I spend thousands of pounds a night to, to, to keep it going? You know, it's difficult. Shall we go on to the Cotswold Hills Rosé, which has got a really yes. nice story to it. Yeah, great. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to talking about this, actually. Um, so this is the Cotswold Hills Rosé. A bit like the Simpsons, this is another brand new wine to the listings this year. Um, you'll see that we've got kind of a, well, Catherine's very kindly put together like a makeshift um, tasting note sheet for it here, because unfortunately, this wine is only available in the mixed case that we're doing at the moment. And the reason for that is, is that um, they don't make very much of it. So Cotswold Hills is basically a social enterprise run by the Royal Agricultural University in Sirencester. And it is basically the staff and students of the university who are on the 
business and viticulture and winery studies courses, bought about an eight hectare vineyard about three or four years ago and made it up as their kind of their project basically so they all tend the vines they look after it throughout the year they then send the grapes they then send the grapes to three choirs who make their own label so I'm, I'm getting some some echo from somebody sorry that's better um, they then send the grapes to three choirs who make our own label um english white um which is based in newant in gloucestershire and then the profits or the proceeds from selling of the wine goes back to the students at the university to fund their future projects for their future businesses which i think is just the most wine society thing ever like and a, a I, I, I heard about them and I heard the wine was lovely because Martin Folk, who I'm very close with at Three Choirs, had, had had raved about them. And B, I was just like, you know, we've got to we've got to support this. This is just awesome. And you know, I got them to send me some samples. They sent me a sample of rose and a white. And I really like the white actually, but um I, I didn't end up buying it. But the rose I just thought was wonderful. And there is a major thirst for rose at the moment at the wine society and across the uk and i just thought this was this was absolutely smack bang in the middle of you know english rosé deliciousness i think england should do more rosé i think we make wonderful rosé and um yeah, i think this is just a, a cracking example and so yeah the brand is cotswold hills but you know there's there's heart and love kind of behind it which i think is rather nice um it is a blend of Rondo and Ortega. Uh, Ortega is a white grape. Rondo is a, a red grape. And, you know, it's just this elegant kind of cherry and bright strawberry fruity rosé. And, you know, just chill it, open it in the garden and, you know, crack on. Absolutely. It's got that really nice thing that I find about um English wine particularly or sort of GB wine is that because it's so not necessarily up and coming still but it is up and coming but it's not so new still but there's a real sense of community with it yep. and the fact that you know it's bottled by three choirs it's um I mean someone's popped in the the chat the brilliant winemakers of tomorrow make this wine and that's absolutely right it, you know it's 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 keeping the the growing industry growing further i mean it really is a delicious wine and rosé is just one of those wines that if you don't know what to what sort of wine to pair with food go for rosé it's it's just the most food friendly of wines it will go with charcuterie pasta salads it will go with the the perfect picnic food of a scotch egg which is a bit of everything um it now seems to be the perfect time for some scotch egg facts if we'd like those thrown in Apparently Fortnum and Mason are one of the um, people that claim to have invented the Scotch egg in 1738. They definitely popularised it with their, their selling of them in their cold, ready-to-eat foods. Uh, but another theory suggests that the dish evolved from Northern India's Nargisi kofta, which was an egg covered in minced meat and served with a curry, which returning soldiers and others introduced to England. And then a third story claims that it was invented by Scottish farmers as an inexpensive dish. Now, what I'd love to know in the chat is your thoughts on a Scotch egg, whether it's a food that you like to eat or, or not. The best Scotch egg you've ever had, perhaps, because they do pop up in all the gastropubs now, made with things like black pudding, haggis, or if it's just the quick snack that you like to pick up at a petrol station, which is something that I quite often do as a, for a road trip snack. I'm interested to know because in 2019, YouGov found them to be amongst Britain's least liked foodstuffs. Although, understandably, sales did soar in late 2020 when they became synonymous with what we also know as a substantial meal. Let me know what you think of a Scotch egg. I'm, I'm very keen for a Scotch egg. Oh, sure, it's a Scotch egg. That sounds delicious. Oh, nice. <laughs> Worst I've had mac and cheese scotch egg i think that sounds quite nice <laughs> but 
then a guy I, I like mac and cheese. Um, but yeah, that's Scotswood Hills. Um, I, I no, I think it's a wine that actually probably it needs a bit of kind of st- st- swishing and swirling. It's a little bit sulfury maybe when you first open it up. So um, you know, I would I would, but it's it's got texture and it's got weight actually, which uh, only eleven point five percent. I think when a wine's got real weight and texture at that low alcohol, you know, it's it's impressive. So shall we go on to what might be the most interesting wine of the evening? Well, maybe. Yeah, so um, so yeah, we've got the Litmus Orange Bacchus from Kent. So we're back to Kent. And um, oh, I'm trying to get the cork back in. There we go. Um, so this is a project um, which is 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 based at um, Bolney. Sorry, my mind's gone completely blank. Um, I can't remember now. Is it Bolney? Catherine, you had the... It's on the back label, sorry. Denby's, that's the bloody winery, sorry. My mind has gone completely blank. It's Friday evening, it's been a very long week, sorry. Um, yeah, so the wine's made at Denby's, um, but it's... Uh, it's a it's a project um, started by an American winemaker. Actually, he's been working in the UK for for a very very long time, and we've never bought from them before. Actually, and I was looking at again the constant struggle to find latest releases from wineries, and I tried their twenty nineteen Bacchus Orange, and and I thought it was really amazing. Actually, I really loved it, um, but it wasn't orange enough. For me and so i sent them a message saying you know a bit more time on the skins which i'll go on to in a minute about orange wine and they released the 2020 and hopefully they listened to my advice well at least i think they did because they did leave it a bit longer on the skins and there's a little bit more orange and i think the 2020 is equally delicious and so i bought it so what what is an orange wine that's probably the best place to start um an orange wine is basically a white wine that's vinified like a red wine and so you're leaving the 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 juice and the skins together um, for, for a period of time to extract a bit of colour, to extract a bit of texture, to extract a bit of tannin, to extract a little bit of that kind of phenolic, grippy, aromatic character. Um, so no, it's, it's, not, it's not wine made from oranges, um, which, which some people might think. Um, and it leaves this, I mean, to be, perfect, to be perfectly honest, I would be happily, I would, I'd be very keen to label this wine as just Bacchus 2020. Because I don't think it's that orange, if that makes sense. But unfortunately, the wine is literally called Orange, and so I, I can't change its name. Um, but I would, you know, I would take this as just a standard Bacchus wine. Um, it's ninety percent Bacchus, and it's got ten percent Pinot Noir in it. Um, the the Bacchus spends um, eighteen weeks on the skins, which is surprising actually, because it's not that deep in colour. But it's um, it's in a very anaerobic environment. Um, but they don't use SO two to to starve off the oxygen. It's just more um, you know in a very neutral environment. Um, and it's got this kind of well, I should say actually that um, the Pinot Noir is the ten percent Pinot Noir is fermented in in old oak. Again, just to build out that texture. Um, but the Pinot Noir is vinified, ironically, like a white wine. So the white wine is vinified like a red wine and the red wine is vinified like a white wine. And so in the end, you don't get really that much colour. It's still a very, very pale, slightly orange, maybe a little bit golden, kind of rose gold in the glass. But, you know, I wouldn't call this a quintessential orange wine. Um, And what you get is this lovely kind of lime leaf, um, herby, kind of almost slightly fennelly, um, white wine on the nose, but again with lovely texture. And what I think you should get with orange wine is tannins. And you do get some lovely tannins on this. I love white wines that have structure, and this has got great structure. It really does slightly coat the underside of your lips and your gums. But again, there's that mid palate. There is weight, there is freshness. There is fruit, which is good 
for orange wine because a lot of orange wines don't have any fruit and they're just this weird kind of spicy savory mixture but this is genuinely fruity and um i think it's really very delicious and i, I think Catherine, you should take it away with the food and wine matching because this is definitely a wine to go with food absolutely and the, the fennel on there is just the also a little bit of um perhaps some sort of caraway seeds some slight aniseedy elements yep. as well definitely yeah that kind of slight aniseedy mm. note in the palette yeah i mean the back note is, says i think it says kind of marzipani yeah, yeah. Uh, such a, a vanilla i don't understand i don't understand that i'm not too sure who's written their back label but <laughs> i definitely don't get vanilla but mm. that's just but absolutely it's a definite like the rosé i mean it's a, it's a definite foodie wine even more so you can you can go harder here because you've got the grip and you've got the tannins so pork pies is your your go-to i would say for this sort of thing real um, meaty, so some sausages, um, chipolatas, charcuterie, really nice protein heavy food. And that's kind of protein of the, um, the mouthfeel as well. So not necessarily something that's, um, it's sort of protein texturally. So things that are high in protein, like um, vegetarian sausages or um, things like uh, tofu, they don't necessarily give you the same mouthfeel unless you've got a bit of a seasoning on them. But anything, um, again, some really nice hard cheeses, some good strong cheddar would be perfect with it. Um, but I think, I mean, for me, it's just it's just crying out for, for pork pie, which leads me very nicely into my final facts of the evening, which is um, about the humble pork pie. So do indulge me while... I do this before we can then all indulge in a pork pie. Um, they are a direct descendant of medieval meat pies and a traditional pie is a mix of fat and cured meat, um, which is pink, and they're in a hot water crust pastry with jelly added as the meat shrinks when cooked. Now, historically, they could have used um, melted butter or aspic, but pork pie makers now will use a 6%, um, what is the word? A 6% gelatin um, solution <laughs> for their jelly. The other pork pie that you will probably be more familiar with is the Melton Mowbray pork pie. Now the real distinctive um, difference and features of Melton Mowbray pork pie in comparison to just a standard pork pie is that the crust is hand formed so it's not nice and neat and it's got the pinches around the side. The meat is uncured, so it is gray in color. So if you're thinking the difference between cured and um, uncured pork, you think of a pork chop in comparison to a slice of ham. And the meat is chopped rather than minced and they are baked freestanding. So they bow outwards um, rather than being nice and straight up the sides. Now, like a wine, they have some European um, protection they've got the the pdo laws came into play and that was granted on the 4th of april 2008 the result being that only pies made within the designated zone of 28 square kilometers around melton mowbray could be called a melton mowbray pork pie and they had to have a traditional recipe using uncured pork so what's everyone thinking on that one Creamy mouthfeel, especially with charcuterie. Absolutely. There you go. Ian saying the orange backers is a lovely surprise. I think I think, yeah, I think that is the the way I would describe it. I think that you know, I, I do a, a few orange wine. Well, I do one main orange wine from Greece, which I love, but that is quite a an ex, not an extreme, but it's more of a it's a more of an extreme example of orange wine than this. This is a very good entry level orange wine if that makes sense it's got a little bit of tannin it's got a little bit of those kind of slightly oxidative characters and it's more about the texture and the kind of slightly more developed kind of orange peely flavors than the more extreme eastern european greek georgian kind of amphora feathery styles so 
I think if you're trying to get into the orange wine phase or craze, then this this is definitely a good one to go for. And I think as well, it can be people can have a preconceived idea of an orange wine because they see an orange wine and they may think, oh, a natural wine, but actually they're they're not the same thing, are they? Oh, don't get me started on natural wine. You'll have me you'll have me tangenting for, for hours. So um no, they're not the same thing. Um, nice and easy. <laughs> they're not the same thing, you know. Natural wine, there's there's no legal definition of natural wine. And so, you know. Don't be put off by an orange wine thinking yeah. it might be natural. Try this. Philip, Philip Shura says they love the Roditas orange. Good. So do I. I think it's a wonderful wine. And so um, you know, if you wanted a if you wanted a step up in terms of orangey wineness, the Roditas orange from Tetramethos in Greece is, is a good one to go for. So I see some people have been eating this evening um, and drinking along with us. So if you would like to uh, be unmuted, if you pop in the chat and we can unmute you if you'd like to share any of your, your thoughts on any of the wines this evening. Well, that's a good question. What temperature would you recommend serving the orange wine? Oh, it's always difficult because we've... we've... <laughs> We had someone complaining about we always mention kind of 16 or 17 degrees and then they're like well how do you know that it's that temperature and i'm like well i don't know i don't um <laughs> i would i would serve it chilled but not too chilled so i would that's just not helpful at all is it i would put it in the fridge overnight and then when you're about to drink it i would take it out of the fridge half an hour before you were to drink it mm. let it come up to you know i want to, in my mind I want to say 14, 15 degrees, not too warm, not too cold. Um, Cause I think, I think it's a very expressive wine and, and it's got those kind of savory, slightly floral characters. And so I think too cold and you'd mute them a bit, whereas mm -hmm. too warm, I think they might be a bit overpowering. Um, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a person who says, you know, chuck it in the fridge, take it out of the fridge, pour a glass and just leave it on the table. And the second that you think that you pour a glass and you take your first sip and go, maybe a bit too warm, just put it back in the fridge. And by the time you finish that glass, it'll be it'll be back to temperature. You know, I always say that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not too uppity with with temperatures, and so it's yeah. a nice general sort of rule of thumb, isn't it? If you've got a a fuller bodied white wine, or perhaps um, the the orange wine, or even a rosé that you think you know twenty out of the fridge twenty minutes before you want to drink it. And then on the other flip side, if you've got a red wine that you want to give a little bit of a chill to, 20 minutes, half an hour in before you want to serve it. So just enough. But again, it depends what you're eating it with. It depends whether you're outside and it's baking hot, you know, and you want something quick and refreshing. It's, yep. it's really one of those things that's uh, it's preference. Yeah, I, I would definitely say that English still wine, definitely, and, and sparkling, to be honest. It, they are... In my mind, they are designed to be refreshing drinks. They are perfect in kind of spring and summer. And so err on the side of caution and serve them a bit too chilled. And then they can warm up in the glass, you know. Um, they are designed to be bright and lively and refreshing. Um, but perhaps, yeah, with the orange, maybe just a little bit warmer than you would for, would for the rest. Because it is, it's, a, it's a complex wine, I think. I think you're getting quite a lot of money, uh, quite a lot of wine there. So. absolutely if you have been trying um all or any of the wines this evening pop in the flavor what um pop in the flavor pop in the chat, which one was your your favorite perhaps we'll have a show of virtual hands as to what might have been the favorite it looked like quite a few people maybe had the litmus was that then your favorite it did seem like quite a popular option i was surprised to see how many people had um had got it it's been it's been on the web for a, for a little bit longer, but um yeah I, I'm I'm excited by it. I think it's a delicious wine, and so I should say these wines are all currently still available. Obviously, the Cotswold Hills is in the mixed case, but so is the um the Stopham, the Pinot Blanc, and the Simpsons Gravel Chardonnay. So, if you wanted to, along with some others from the the English range, so if you wanted to try the the Cotswold Hills, it's a nice nice case to buy. Ooh, there we go. We've got the Screen share if you'd like that. Some of the other lovely wines in there. 
Oh, Beth loves the orange Bacchus. Yeah, I'm with you there, Beth. Thank you, Beth. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice, isn't it? You know, I'd, I'd be re I'd be really interested to see how that ages, because um, I th I think that could get really, really funky and a bit quirky with you know a year or two. Um, so someone's asked me, Beth. Beth, the direct message has asked me what's my favourite. Oh, it's difficult. It's difficult. I, I I have to say I I really I really like the Bacchus. I, I really like the orange Bacchus. I, I met when I first when I first tried it and bought it. I've not tried it since then, and I really liked it then. But the kind of three or four months that have elapsed since I first tried it, I think it's really come together and it's a really delicious wine. It's got way more weight and way more kind of complexity to it. Um, that and you should really say and when you're asked for your favourite, should you? But um, the one that I would be absolutely glugging down this evening will probably be the Camel Valley Rosé because it is just... It looks like that's what the, uh, the numbers split is on as well. So it's the Camel Valley and the, the Bacchus. Yeah. I have to agree with, I mean, it was just so delicious. Pretty good. I had a, a great question from Simon. Um, so whereabouts in England will climate change move the French wines? Sorry, to whereabouts in England will climate change move the French wines now on chalk there? Simon, do you perhaps want to unmute? <laughs> I can't quite get my head around that. <laughs> Have we got Simon there? Coming up. Yeah, here I'm coming up. Hello there, Simon. What, what, what would you like to ask? Well, I'm being told that, that there's a band of chalk that runs from where places in France where we currently grow some interesting white wines like Chablis, Chablis and places like that. Mm -hmm. And that the temperature is that they had there 15 years ago is getting to be the temperature we now have in Kent, mm -hmm. where there is some chalk. And that that trend is going to continue. And I've heard people starting to say that East Anglia is very going to be very interesting. So you're, you're the whizzes on this. Where should we be looking out for the great French wines to migrate to the sort of Brexit thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting you should say that actually because um, the, 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 it's going to sound very on PC here, but the, the French have already come and planted vines in, in the UK. So there's Domaine Everand um, in Kent, which is the Tattinger project. And so Tattinger have already planted vines in, in Kent for their next, their next thing. Um, but you're absolutely right in saying that there is the, the seam of chalk that runs basically from Champagne, uh, from the Côte de Blanc, the Montagne de Rams, which basically runs up through the north of France, under the channel, into Kent, and then goes down through, not necessarily mess through Sussex, um, but it definitely raises its head again in Hampshire, um, when they have a lot of chalk in Hampshire. And so I expect to see a lot more French plantings over the coming years in Kent and Hampshire and probably in Sussex as well. Um, but um, it's going to be interesting to see the the you know the Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are the most planted grapes in England by a long way by a long way. I think I think between them they make up about ninety percent of plantings in the UK, and I only see that increasing. Um, you know, I a lot of people give Bacchus a bit of a tough time. I quite like it. I think it's quite an elegant, fresh, aromatic variety. But plantings of Bacchus are just way down, and there isn't that much interest in other great varieties. But Chardonnay and Pinot seem to be the ones to go for, and Kent and and you know, as we've seen with Simpsons, I think they make one of, if not the best, um, Chardonnay and arguably Pinot Noir in in the UK. Gusborne make a wonderful Pinot Noir which we may be offering later this year. Keep an eye out. Um, and so, yeah, Kent, um, in terms of still wine, I think is going to be the hotbed for, for the next kind of three, four years in terms of kind of combating the, the French style. So, yeah, good question. I hope that answered it, by the way. Sorry if I got the completely wrong. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, thank you. 
Yeah, no, you've got the, the right. The, the question is whether there's a sort of generic shift happening here, which yeah. we shall have fun watching how it manifests itself with brilliant British winemakers and yeah. you, your, you're absolutely, your you're market steering skills. So yeah, it's, you're, it's you're absolutely, you're the game absolutely is right. on. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right in terms of the temperature difference as well. I mean, the kind of champagne heyday of the 60s, 70s and 80s, we've now got a similar average temperature to, to then. And so, you know, it's an exciting time for English sparkling, especially. I look like we might have Jeff Thanks. and Jane wanting to unmute to make a comment. So, uh, yeah, hi. It was just to follow on from that. It was a question that I, I, I wanted to ask earlier, but that's a perfect timing, um, Simon. Thank you. Uh, and that's how far north in England do you buy wine in the and obviously sell it again in uh, in the wine society? I mean, where. Is it down south or are you coming up further? We live in Sheffield, so we're just curious, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a very, 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 very good question. Um, so first off, I should say that there are vineyards in the UK probably far further north than you maybe it may expect. I, I Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, but um, I believe the furthest north is kind of Yorkshire at the moment, kind of North Yorkshire. I don't believe there's any serious commercial vineyards further north than that. Um, in terms of um, where the further north, furthest north that we buy from, ironically, it's actually the place that we've worked with for the longest, which is Three Choirs, which is new in, in Gloucestershire, which doesn't sound very far north, which, which it isn't. Um, but... Um, yeah, Martin Folk at Three Choirs is one of the kind of pioneers, I suppose, of 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 English still wine. And so, you know, kind of the you know, northwest Gloucestershire, kind of northeast Welsh border. Um there is stuff made further north than that, but you're right in that the vast majority is is south coast. Um I, I think I saw some stats earlier that um I got asked a question about Welsh wine earlier on this week. I think Welsh wine makes up, in terms of vineyards, hectares planted across the UK, I think it makes up less than 1% of total UK acreage or hectareage, which is, you know, it's tiny. Um, and then, you know, Kent and Sussex and um, Hampshire, and uh, it makes up well over 80%, I believe. That's literally just off the top of my head from seeing us actually that I saw the other day, but it's a significant amount is all on the south coast. But we will see that rise further north, but, you know, it takes a long time. Well, it takes a few years at least for vines to really start producing quality fruit. Although having said that, I did try a wine earlier today um, from a winery with the vines that were literally planted last year or two years ago, and it was absolutely delicious. And so, yeah. Lovely. So... I think that draws us to a lovely end there. Thank you very much, members, for joining us this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you've enjoyed the wines you've been drinking and the food you've been eating while you've been sharing the evening with us. Thank you very much, Matthew, as well, for um, sharing all your knowledge on the, the wines and for buying the wines as well. So we will pop out an email on um, Monday with a reminder of the wines, but... I don't want to promise they'll still be in stock. So perhaps if you are hoping to pick up some, even uh, particularly the Camel Valley, I know that is a little bit on the low stock. I would suggest you get in and do that sooner rather than later, members. I know I will be. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, pleasure to share a glass of wine on a Friday evening with, with you all. So, yeah. And I like doing these where you can see everyone's faces and it feels like a bit more of a kind of social occasion. So thank you very much and have a lovely weekend. I hope it's sunny and uh, I'm pl I plan on watching lots of rugby tomorrow and I hope you do the same if you're a rugby fan. Wonderful. Cheers. Good night, everyone. Cheers, everybody. Bye.